Until the middle of the century, much of the world was under European control. Many Europeans believed it was their destiny to rule the world. That only whites had the wisdom and know-how to manage countries in Asia and Africa effectively. In India, most of its 300 million people were resigned to this fate and led their lives in rural poverty, as they had for centuries. But one man, Mohandas K. Gandhi, offered them a message of hope. He urged all Indians to join him in a struggle for freedom from British rule. Millions followed Gandhi's lead, joining the mass marches and boycotts he organized in the 1930s. If England does not uh, grant uh, your demands, what course of action will you follow then? Of course civil disobedience. Are you prepared to return to jail again? I am always prepared to return to jail. <laughs> After World War II, the British no longer had the power or will to hold on. Gandhi's quest for Indian independence was realized. It was the start of a shift of power that continued for 30 years as the people of Asia and Africa fought to take charge of their own destinies. August 1947, the birth of a nation. India was about to become the largest democracy the world had ever known. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, spoke to a hopeful nation. Some years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. Not only or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Nehru's speech was heard all across the country. Belinda Cower, a schoolgirl in Delhi, had listened transfixed to the family radio. We all sat up that night, and then when the dawn came, I cannot describe to you how heady that feeling was. It was as though everything was new. The world was new. The, the, well, the, you know, the trees were greener and everything looked as though everything was it, it just too fantastic. You know, you, you felt you could do anything now that we were free. Indians poured into the capital to witness the ceremonies. Satpal Saini walked nearly six miles from his village. On the 14th of August, we were working in our fields. In the middle of the night, we started our journey to the Red Fort, walking the nine kilometers on foot. The next morning, there were over 100,000 people there, and the atmosphere was very, very happy. People were shouting slogans in praise of Gandhi. A silver coin of one rupee, victory for Gandhiji. People would try to touch Gandhi's feet in respect, but he never allowed that. He said, don't bow before another person or another nation. The final scene during this great moment in India's history was the ceremony of the flag in the evening. The saffron, white and green tricolor was publicly unfurled. First, he, the Union Jack came down. Uh, then the tricolor went up. It's my happiest memory. For us, at that time, it was something as though we were being given freedom.
but the dawn of independence was fraught with difficulty. New borderlines had been drawn up hastily, creating Hindu India and Muslim Pakistan. In the next few weeks, a terrible price would be paid for the speed with which the subcontinent had been partitioned. Millions were caught on the wrong side of the new borders. Religious hatreds flared up. Communities were attacked. Up to 30 million refugees fled out of Pakistan or out of India to avoid being caught in a beleaguered minority. Up to half a million were slaughtered. The partition and massacres horrified Gandhi, but his pleas for tolerance went ignored. By 1948, Gandhi was dead, assassinated by a Hindu extremist. Despite the ordeal of Free India's birth, the nationalist leaders had shown the rest of the world what could be done. Gandhi had said that if India broke free, others would follow. He now became an inspiration for subject peoples everywhere. <laughs>